uh, digestive health range of products. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you all today to listen and observe a webinar presented by Professor Gothberg from Sweden. Um, I would like to just run through some quick housekeeping for the webinar before we get into the presentation. Um, first and foremost, we would like you to feel free to ask questions using a text box service at the bottom right hand screen of the webinar page. Um, so you can fill in um, whatever your questions might be throughout the webinar and we will save those questions for the end um, and allow some time for us to propose those questions to Professor Gothberg um, and hopefully give to those queries. Um, we won't be able to take any verbal questions. Um, you obviously will be able to hear us. We won't be able to hear you. So this will be the way um, that we would need you to ask questions through the text service at the bottom of the screen. At the end of the presentation, we would very much uh, welcome you to complete just a two-question survey uh, purely to help us understand a little bit more about your current practices within your hospital and um, to help us understand a little bit more about the um, current situation um, in your hospital. We anticipate that the webinar should last approximately half an hour for the Professor Gothberg presentation um, and we should allow um, a minimum of 15 minutes at the end for questions uh, but depending on the uh, throughput and the number of it, amount of interest we would uh, be happy to extend that a little bit. Um, okay, thank you very much indeed. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Gunnar Gothberg to come to the UK and deliver his presentation on the one-step insertion of low-profile gastrostomy uh, in paediatric patients versus conventional pull peg, uh, including a retrospective analysis of outcomes. Professor Gothberg. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, I'm really honored and and happy to be here and be able to uh, share with you my experiences with the gastrostomy technique, minimal invasive technique, which I have learned in the late 80s when I was training um, general surgery. Uh, and um, so at that time, I um, learned the technique that was introduced by the Gauderer and it presented the the first time in 1980, and uh, we used it in, in uh, old uh, cancer patients, uh, as I remember. Then, uh, when I changed for pediatric surgery and came there in 1991 to the Department of Pediatric Surgery in Gothenburg, at the Queen Silvia Children's Hospital, which belongs to Solgrenska University Hospital, I uh, brought with me this technique and we started to use it on. Um, that at that time it was teenagers with uh, mostly often usually uh, severe uh, central palsy and, and uh, neurological impairment and uh, from that time we have learned and we have good experience and nowadays as you will see later on we use it mostly and do it mostly on, on babies actually so i will give you uh, a review of our experience on, on the pull peg technique and um, then uh, at the time when the introducer kit allowed us to, to uh, put in a, a balloon uh, tube, uh, we, we, we changed for that technique because it gave a lot of advantages. We, at that time we had problem with the waiting list, a lot of patients that was waiting for changing the, the peg tube to a, a, a button. And um, in 2013, we did a retrospective analysis of our results, and I will show those, uh, which actually says that it, it's not a big difference between the techniques when it comes to uh, complications and disadvantages. Uh, so, uh, so for us, when we changed the technique, it, uh, it went very smoothly. And in the end, I will show the uh, cartoons and uh, and some pictures of how we do the procedure. So as you know, as pediatricians and, and working with children, you know that there is a variety of, of indications for, for gastrostomy. And um, actually it could be a quite healthy baby, just very normal, but does, does not eat 
it, it uh, will not eat, will not take the bottle, will not take the breast, and that could be really hard for the for the far parent, the mother, and the child. And, and th then it could be a good thing to put a gastrostomy there for a while when the child is learning how to eat. When we have the very, very small premature children, and we have children with uh, cardiac malformation that doesn't have the, the strength to eat properly, then we put in a nasogastric tube for feeding. And those babies who pass the age, as you know, when they pass the age of four, five, six, seven months of age, they don't learn how to swallow. And then they are stuck to the tube. And that, for that reason, the gastrostomy is good to use for uh, some years until they are, have learned how to swallow. It could be malformations in the mouth and the neck area. And, and uh, which hinders swallowing and uh, well, gastrostomy is, uh, is indicated. The majority of our patients is uh, with the functionally disabled children, usually after an uh, episode of asphyxia during the, the uh, labor and delivery. And uh, as I said at the beginning, we did this in, in teenagers that was heavily malnutrition, but today we do it already when the child is just two, three, four months of age, when, the, when the, we know that they will not be able to swallow due to, for instance, spasticity. It could be chronic disorders such as renal failure and or severe allergia that, that demands a special uh, treatment, special uh, uh, nutritional regimens. And in our hospital, we, we uh, also use the gastrostomy technique on um, children with malignant disease. And usually it is uh, those with uh, leukemia and uh, who will be treated by stem cell transplantation. And uh, then for a while, six to 12 months of time, they are uh, uh, have great benefits of uh, gastrostomy. So that is the background for all our gastrostomy procedures, which is more than 50 a year. We used to um, use the Frika pull peg because it is uh, safe and it is with this uh, internal plate, it can't be just pulled out. Uh, if you use a tube with a, with a olive or something, it, the child can pull it out accidentally. So we, pref we prefer this, this, uh, this uh, uh, tube and, and um, that what, which we have used for many years and still use when we you, you put in a pull, what we call a pull peg. So at the time when the um, MIC introducer kit was, was launched on the market, that was in the end of 2008, we had a situation there where we did about 50 new gastrostomies a year, but at the same time we have the demand for changing the, the peg button to a, to a balloon tamed gastrostomy tube, usually a, a button. And that may give, gave us a problem in the hospital because it is, even if the procedure is just five to ten minutes, it will occupy the operating room for about an hour. So our waiting list for the, to, to put in a peg was, was uh, becoming long. So we found that this possibility to do it in one procedure was um, uh, a very, very good news for us. And we, we immediately started to use it. And um, we found out very rapidly that it was uh, about the same um, difficulties or, or as easy as it used to be to do the pull peg technique. So if you are an, an, a person in Sweden who is experienced with the pull peg, it is not a very big deal to change the technique actually. So it is, comes in a, in a package like this. And um, the new thing about it is that we have these what you call anchor sutures, special needles with a special suture. It's, it's uh, resorbable. But in the end, it has a an, an metallic bar which uh, acts as an anchor. And by that, you can keep the, the stomach, the ventricle, anchored to the abdominal wall, uh, which is of 
big importance for the safety. And then this thing, what we call the, the split tube or, or the dilator uh, thing, is, is also the, the one that makes it possible to put in a below retain thing. Because in the end, you have just a tube that is split in two and, by, and then removed. So when the procedure is uh, finished, it, it looks like this with the button in center and we have these three anchor sutures with the locker buttons above the skin. And we find out that if we intend to, to do a, a, a peg or, 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 a, or a, we can introduce a kit procedure, it's not 100% a success because there are a few cases that can't be done due to anatomical reasons. Uh, the child could be, have, for instance, uh, scoliosis of that degree that the stomach actually is, is uh, hidden behind the ribs, or it could be a large liver in, in between. So, so there is a few percent of patients that can't, can't, uh, we can't do this procedure within, and then we have to put, can use the laparoscope, or in the end, uh, has to do it by open procedure. But then, if we have been able to place the, the tube, it is uh, working for 100%. So, if you look then at that time, and we look uh, retrospective with this uh, eight-year period from uh, 2005, when we did the pull peg, until the end of 2008, we have 168 procedures, and uh, from 1000, in the end of 2008 until 12, we did had 206 patients that was uh, scheduled for a gastrostomy with the with the introducer kit. And as you see, the mean age is uh, very low, and uh, actually the majority is uh, is uh, below the age of two. So it's just small babies, all of them. Uh, the gender distribution is even. And um, the smallest one in the duty kit is just at the weight of two kilo. And in the full peg, it was three kilos. But that is actually reflecting this. The number is greater and the weight is lower. That is indicating the change that we use it more frequently, and we actually do it in smaller babies. As, um, as I said, there are different clinical backgrounds, and the majority of the patients has the uh, neurological reason for it. It could be also a cardiac reason, the, the relation to oncology, to uh, digestive and, and, and renal reasons, and other reasons. But as you see, with, in both groups, the majority is related to neurological disorders. Uh, the procedure, doing a pull peg, the minimum time was eight minutes, and we had a median time of 50 minutes. And then switching to, to uh, uh, the Mickey introduce a kit, well, the time, the median time has increased by five minutes, but the still we can do it very rapidly. Sometimes it takes a while, but this difference in five minutes is not of clinical importance, I find. And then um, after the procedure, we, um, we wait uh, four hours with the tube open to, to get rid of air and uh, close it for two more hours. And then we start feeding, and the, here we give some water with 1% uh, of saline and 10% of sugar. And, and that is the first feed. We give 30 to 40 ml of it. And um, we do that uh, after eight hours. And, and uh, then if everything all right, we start with the nutritional feed, breast milk or, or formula feed. And um, again, we start with 75, 80 ml, and then increase by every meal. And um, uh, 
If we do the procedure in the morning, we, we usually start the nutritional feed in the afternoon. If we do it in the afternoon, then uh, it will be until next morning. And um, usually we can, the, the child and family can leave the hospital the evening after the procedure. Well, is there any complications? Well, of course there is some, but not, not in a large number. We had uh, two cases where the balloon uh, broke, so we had, or, or the, the, the water came out for some reason, so it slipped out. And uh, it was uh, successfully replaced, but uh, we did it in, in the, the theater again, guided by, by uh, the gastroscopy, or the alternative would have been uh, guided by x-ray and, and uh, contrast. So we recommend that if the, the thing is slipped out within the first week or even two weeks, it should be doing done with, with great caution. Um, there was a t two situations with the leakage and, and uh, with some infection, with that not severe, but still. And uh, in one case, there was a bleeding from, from the stoma, and that was actually in a, uh, in a uh, cancer patient which, which uh, had a tendency for, for bleeding. So we had to, to stop that with the quarter, electric cautery. So when then following up to see what happens, um, when, when the children was at the charge, it was 97, 96% without any issues at all. And in very few, there was a bit of irritation. And, and also, we have learned with this technique that, that it shouldn't, the button shouldn't be too short and, and the, and the um, locker suture shouldn't be too tight. Then at the first follow-up, which is after two to three weeks, uh, when we uh, remove the, the sutures, there is, uh, sometimes there is a slight irritation and um, hypergranulation emerges. And then later on, after about six months, uh, we see hypergranulation in, in a proportion of the 25% in, in the McKee group. And, uh, and uh, that is at that time only four or five percent, but during the period, uh, Patients have had hypergranulation and some irritation. So, healthy, no issues at all during the time. It is a large proportion in the pull peg, but still the majority also with the, with the key, introduce a kit. And, and the, I come back to that, what, what, what is important thing to, to think about if to prevent from hypergranulation. I think there is something one can do about it. This is uh, how it looks like when it is uh, irritated by granulation and uh, uh, so this is also due to some leakage. And with this, this picture shows that if the sutures are left for too long, it will uh, create some irritation. The sutures are resorbable, but in children it takes the long. The time for resorption is too long, so we have learned that it's better to cut it and take them away after two to three weeks. And also, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be locked too uh, too tight. Uh, they are only there for security. As long as the balloon is okay, uh, it will be staying by 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 itself. So if it is only when, if the balloon breaks and the button is falling out, then we need the, these anchor sutures. So um, they are there for safety, and we have learned that it shouldn't be tight at all. It should actually be, be uh, several millimeters in between the locker button and the skin. And, um, 
some major reverse events we found, and actually that was in the cohort of pull peg. There was one with uh, with important leakage, and um, actually it has been a dislodgement, and it was to to long distance between the inner bumper and the skin. And in that particular case, we we did a laparotomy to 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 secure it and, and do some revision. Um, in this patient, which was treated for malignancy, um, after a while, some weeks, we had problem with, with uh, leakage, and we found out that there was actually a stricture of the intestine distal to the, and, and we had to go in and do a resection. So it's not, it wasn't related actually to the, to the gastrostomy itself, but it was due to uh, 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 obstruction of the intestine. And we found one silent fistula between uh, where, where, where the gastrostomy would, would went through the colon. So, so when that was um, recognized, we had to, to do a laparotomy. And that was when we changed the, the pull peg for a, uh, for a button. And uh, we had also one case of what's called varied peg bumper. So in all these 374 cases, we had four major adverse events. So that is less than 1%. So now to the technique. And um, uh, as always, it's, general uh, it's a general anesthesia, so they have to be fastened for, for at least 12 to do it in general anesthesia. And we determine the ideal puncture by, by uh, the phanoscopy. So we have uh, on the gastroscope, there is a light. And, um, and uh, if we pull off the light in the room, we see it here that is enlightening through the, the abdominal wall. And actually, in small children and with thin abdominal wall, it's very easy. To, to, to find this spot. And you have the shadow of the liver over here, you have the shadow of the rib, and then shadow of, of intestine. So you find an open spot here. And then this spot has to be as wide as you, so you can put in three anchor sutures and then made the incision for the, for the um, dilator device. Um, we start with the, the, the with, it comes with three, four preloaded safety pex needles, but we usually use just three. And um, I can say that after if one of these or even two of these um, fell fall off within uh, the first uh, week or so, it's 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 of no. Problem because as long as we have one safety situ left, it is still uh, at anchor to the abdominal wall. And as you see here, the 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 suture, the thread at the end there is a metal bar, so it will be when it's pulled back, it will stay there as a, as a kind of anchor. So this is how it looks like. This uh, just ordinary needle. And you, you have a release mechanism so that you, the, the, the end of the suture is released and uh, comes into the lumen of the, of the ventricle. And then you pull it back. Next step is to do the incision for the dilator tube. And this here it is important that this incision is not too wide. It has to, and it has to go. Uh, through the fascia as well. So compared with the, with the um, uh, just pull peg, this has to be a bit wider and a bit deeper. And that is, I think, this is the key point to where, why we see hypergranulation more often with this technique. So it has to be, has to be small. And then we put in the serodilator tube, which is uh, very narrow at the beginning. And then we remove 
um, that you see it's stepwise. Uh, you remove sheet by sheet, or just in, to start with, you introduce tube by tube to get it wider, and the red is indicated the width of the um, of the uh, tube you are using. We usually do put in a 14 French. So this is how it looks from inside. Here you have the later, the later tube, and you see the anchor suture as well. Pull back. So then you change that for a uh, storm meshing device, and that is a tube with the balloon at the end, and and by that you can uh, uh, pull it back, and uh, by that measure the length. Of the uh, of the tube that is will be put into place, and uh, that too should should be at least two millimeters longer than the, than the what we call the minimal length. So that because there is some swelling the first day after the procedure, and um, you push that down and you measure, and then you should have some extra millimeters here for the length of the button. And as you see here. As long as we do the procedure, we have just forceps um, grabbing the sutures, and we will lock the anchors uh, at the end. And then finally, there is this possibility to... The, the inner part is removed, and the most outer part can be divided into two parts, and by that uh, be removed. So in the end, we have this... Uh, Button with the balloon and the three anchor suitors. So that's how it looks alike. And we remove the inner parts and then split the outer part like that. And the button is pushed. While those are removed, the button is pushed in. So that is how it ends up. And as I said, these shouldn't be too tight. And there should be some extra millimeters for the for the um, uh, button to have place. So at the end, we, as I said, we uh, start feeding with water after about six hours, and that is water containing one percent of uh, saline and ten percent of sugar. About that, and. Um, we do, do that for two or three times and then change for breast milk or formula feed or whatever. Uh, the wound should be kept clean, but uh, out of the bathing tube for about two or three weeks. Um, as I say, we always remove the sutures and uh, the stoma has to be clean. And uh, as long as it is clean, we use just soap and water. If it, it becomes uh, a bit irritated, we use um, disinfectant. Uh, and um, the balloon shall be checked for, for the content of water every second week. And we do that the first time within uh, the hospital or at an out clinic. Uh, uh, ward where, where the specially trained nurses meet the patient and learn how to how to take care of it and learn the parents how to change water and then the first change to the next button will take place also in in uh, the ward or the hospital uh, or the outpatient clinic guided by the nurse and then by time the parents will learn how to make these changes so, I will, in summary, it is an advantage to use this introducer kit when, for instance, have a situation that we can't pass uh, the esophagus. We just, if, as long as we can pass a very thin scope, endoscope, so we can, so we can look inside, uh, it is very convenient to, to do the procedure. And we do when the one uh, endoscope is pushed, put in at once. And, and as my experience, it was not e uh, hard to learn this technique. It is very comparable with the ordinary pull peg technique. Uh, so, so changing the technique was not 
uh, challenging. Um, and we have so far haven't uh, had any serious early complication. As I said, it was one bleeding that was a bit heavy, but but no no not no need for for trans uh, for for blood just to to, uh, to get it back to operating room to to stop bleeding. And of course, it it is considered a sterile technique and. Um, uh, and uh, there is no hinder to do it in, in very, just very small babies, and we do it under protection of antibiotics. We do give one uh, dose of antibiotics before the procedures. And that's uh, in the long run, we can put in uh, a balloon retained gastrostomy at, at once, and which is uh, positive for for the child and the family. And uh, they doesn't have to come back for an uh, for another session, and it is positive for 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 uh, uh, the child to to mobilize with the just the balloon. And this is really the, why we changed that we didn't have to have another section in the operating room under general anesthesia. So we, and the, and the time needed for the procedure is comparable. And um, as um, it was um, calculated by Jacob in this uh, uh, paper from 2005, it is really cheaper to do this in one stage than in, in, in two stages. So in conclusion, the one step introduced kit produced for low profile gastrostomy to placement delivers similar results in respect to time spent, time passes to first feed, and types of complications. And it's easy trainable one step procedure accommodates better patient's quality and convenience, lower cost, and um, complication is actually of minimal risk. And by that, I, I uh, thank, say thank you to all of you for, for listening, and uh, we are glad to uh, have some uh, questions from you all. Thank you. Professor Gothberg, thank you very much indeed. Um, we very much appreciate your trouble to come over and to share your experiences. Um, before we go into the questions, I'd like to just um, briefly ask our um, customers who have dialed in to complete um, the first of two questions. It's really just to understand a little bit more about current placement techniques for primary gastrostomy in children. Um, there's a list of um, different insertion techniques available. <clears throat> and if we could just allow for 20 for our customers to click on either or a multiple of those options um, before we move on to the next question. So we'll give that just 20 seconds for you to complete. Thank you. Okay, we'll just give another five seconds or so. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Interesting to see that from the feedback we've received from that question, the majority of um, primary um, placement techniques in paediatrics is the conventional peg-pull technique. Um, the next question we'd just like to ask you very briefly, a second question here, um, which is, would you consider using the Halyard Health Introducer Kit following um, the information presented uh, in this webinar. So again, we'll just leave another 20 to 30 seconds for you to um, give your feedback. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, just another five seconds or so. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. 
Um, again, the, the poll suggests that um, of the um, eight out of the 20 people dialing in, 40% of those uh, would be interested to um, know more at least or to consider using the Halyard Health Introducer Kit and 5% wouldn't. Um, that's the end of our service. We didn't want this to be too overbearing in terms of, of questions. Now, um, there are a few questions that we've fielded um, prior to this webinar that um, we would very much like to um, ask Professor Gothberg while we've got you with us. Um, and one of the questions is, we've done an analysis here of um, one-step insertion of low-profile gastrostomy in paediatric patients versus pull peg. Now, our experience within the UK marketplace is that there are a number of other ways of inserting low-profile devices. There may be um, a usage Georgeson technique that might be used. Um, there may be more um, laparoscopic techniques. Professor Gothberg, my question to you is, is how would you say that, that using the Mickey Introducer Kit is perhaps a viable op option for those alternative techniques that are currently being used? Uh, well, actually, I think it's very much depending on, on what the local tradition is in the hospital or for you as a surgical team. Um, as we have it in Sweden, we have uh, four centers uh, for pediatric surgery. Uh, in our department, we do the majority with, with the uh, pull peg and now the mic introducer kit, but there is other centers that has been using the laparoscope for, for guidance since uh, the early 90s, and they, still, they feel very comfortable with using the laparoscopy as a guidance equipment. But also what they do, they actually use part of this uh, introducer kit to, um, to uh, for instance, the, 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 the anchor shooters and, and the lighter device. So I think actually sometimes it can be a mix of uh, procedures. But uh, basically, I think if you are used to do it using a gas endoscope, the gastroscope, it is uh, easy to change. If you are used to do it with the radiological guidance, then it's, it's a larger step to, to change. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have had a question that's come in on the chat portal. Um, a question is, is, why do you recommend a two-week balloon check? Well, um, in this, well, it, it is, uh, here it is uh, two, 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 two uh, reasons. The first is that we do the first check to after, about two weeks after the procedure. And uh, the, the, the child and the parents are coming to, to our nurse, especially trained nurse, or either in the hospital or at the local distance hospital. Uh, and the, actually, the parent has to learn how to check the volume of the balloon. So you can't do it too often. You shouldn't do it to sell them. And, and it, it, we have learned that if you forget to check the volume of the balloon, it can be slipped out. So uh, it's a good habit to do that check about every second week, actually. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Um, while we wait for some more chat questions to come in, there's a very um, important question that um, we experience engaging with some of our pediatric surgeons, specifically here in the United Kingdom, where potentially there is a perception that the pull peg technique um, or the fact that a peg is in situ is safer than using a, a low profile balloon gastrostomy tube because there is the concern of balloon failure, balloon popping at the early stages and the potential for the tube to be removed and peritonitis. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that particular point? Well, as you saw, it happened for us two times in, 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 uh, in the population of 200. So it's uh, the amount of 1%. It actually, nothing happened because the anchor shooters secure it, so it, there is no leakage and there is no peritonitis due to that the balloon is slipped out. The only uh, challenge is that how to put the balloon back inside, and if this happens early, and um, I would say within the first two, then it must be done in hospital 
using either uh, the x-ray uh, contrast to be sure that you are putting the balloon at the right place or using the endoscope. But with those two situations, nothing seriously happened to the chart. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'd very much like to um, field another question about perhaps the emotional impact on the, the children's families and the benefit of just coming in for the one procedure. Can you perhaps paint some pictures on the emotional impact to families and their children of not having to come in for a repeat procedure which is associated with the conventional technique? Yes, well, having a patient, having the child put into um, the general anesthesia, taken to the operating to theater area, it is a, a major issue and you have to have a place within the ward so that they can spend at least a full day in hospital. Usually if you do this change from Peca theater to, to the bottom in the morning, they can always leave the hospital in the late afternoon, but they have to stay there for a whole day. If you do it uh, in, in uh, the um, outpatient clinic, it's just a, a short visit, and uh, you do it in, in the area that uh, the children and the fa uh, families are familiar with. That is an area that, where they come and will regularly go back, come back to. So it's really a major change and an important issue to get to, to be able not to use the whole hospital device just for changing a, a gastrome, gastrostomy tube for a button tube. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, another question that um, may be pertinent for some of our, our listeners as well. In terms of um, the financial impact, you alluded um, from a customer point of view that um, you actually saw that there was a commercial benefit mm. to using this particular equipment. Are you able to give us a little bit more detail about what you mean by that? Well, I haven't <coughs> done the calculation myself, no, I don't, but, but thinking of that you have to prepare a place within a board, and have the whole staff at an operating theatre occupied with the child for actually an hour, even if the procedure takes just five, six minutes, it is an hour in the operating field. And that is per minute, it is, um, uh, it is uh, 60 pounds, I guess. Okay. Almost 100 pounds a minute in a theater. Right. So it is of economic importance. Then the device is a bit uh, more expensive, cost, when, when you use it, but uh, in the end, it is uh, you're sparing money and resources and time and risk because every general anesthesia is actually a risk. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have had another question come through um, on the chat form. It says, "Is the technique used anywhere in the UK for pediatric uh, initial placements?" The answer to that question is yes. Uh, we have some established users uh, in Scotland um, at the Glasgow Royal Hospital for Children. Um, we're also aware that it's used um, at Edinburgh Royal. Um, we know that Chelsea and Westminster use the kit and also Leicester um, is a long-standing user for this particular technique. Um, so we hope to be able to grow this. The objective of the webinar is to give a little bit more information, a little bit more insight to see if there is more opportunity in the paediatric environment. I hope that asks you a question. If there's more detail, do feel free to ask. Uh, one other question that has come through. Uh, one issue we have sometimes is related to the small size of those kinds of patients. Do you have any comment on it? Actually, for me, it's the reverse. As I said, a thin abdominal wall makes it easier to, to find the spot where to uh, do the puncture. Um, a small baby at the weight of two kilos at the, at the age of one to two months, if you are in a, a, a clinic with specially trained staff for, uh, for anesthesiology and surgery, actually for us, the size of the child is not the problem. 
I, even for me as a surgeon, it is even easier to do it in the small baby than in a teenager with some subcutaneous fat and so on. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we are expecting a, another response. Um, thank you. Um, one other question I'd very much like to ask you is um, with conversations again with paediatric surgeons, they tend to be um, representing a larger population of those doing primary insertions of gastrostomies. Is the general application, what are the clinical indications that you personally use um, for the one step technique? Um, one of the queries that we have is sometimes that in the UK only a very small patient cohort is determined for this. And what would your view be to say that actually there's a wider application in paediatrics for this technique? Well, actually, as you saw in, in my slide, the indications for, for um, uh, they, they haven't changed. So we do it in, in any kind of indication. So I don't find that, that, that the reason for not do, using the one-step uh, technique uh, is related to, to indication. No, I don't find that okay. at all. Very clear. Thank you very much. Uh, another question that's come through. Um, have you encountered any problems with determining the right button size given the abdominal wall? Well, um, we, we always use the 14 French, even in the smallest babies. I have never found that it is of any importance to use even smaller. No, we, we use the 14 French all the time. And then sometimes the smallest one uh, we can get is 10 millimeters, one centimeter. And it happened that that is a bit too long, but usually uh, it is the right one. And then, as I said, there are um, uh, different lengths of the tube and we measure and we use a balloon that is two to three millimeters longer than the distance from inside to the skin level. So that could be uh, room for some swelling uh, just uh, the first uh, the first time after surgery. Okay. And then uh, uh, coming to the nurse, that sometimes they change for a longer or a shorter uh, tube uh, uh, later on and, and they do not do the change at the two week uh, checkup but they can do it uh, after four or five six weeks if necessary okay thank you i think there's a, a, a an important question to ask is that in the event of any change in a department moving from one tech to technique to another could you perhaps just highlight some of the challenges from your point of view and how you're able to overcome them to ensure that there's a smooth transition to this new technique well, um, during the pull peg, you, you have control of the endoscope yourself at the surgeon, and you can have the nurse to um, actually do the puncture and, and, and in that way assist you all the way. When we do this, um, it should, usually we, have, we are two surgeons. Uh, one is... Uh, um, holding the gastroscope and one is doing the procedure. And actually that is, has turned out to be a good moment for training because I am the experienced surgeon can do the procedure and one of my young colleagues could, could hold the gastroscope and, and, and in that way guide me because I'm looking at the monitor and see what I'm doing inside. So it is a, actually a good moment for, for young surgeons to train doing gastroscopy in children. On the other hand, it is a situation that I am alone at the, the only surgery in the room, then actually I can handle a gastroscope to a, a well-experienced nurse who can hold it for me and, and uh, letting me have the, the, uh, the picture in front. So it, still it can be done by a single surgeon. But usually we are two surgeons. Otherwise, um, yes, as I said, the, the, the incision has to, you have to take care of that this incision is not too wide. That is uh, what you have to learn. And uh, when you close these anchor suture buttons, uh, you have to learn how that, that it should be uh, a little bit loose. You're, you're, you feel that they must be tight and they learn by time that it's wrong. It should be very loosely tightened. 
And so there are some minor issues that you, you learn by time. But are you an experienced? Um, are you experienced with the pull peg technique? Then it is uh, uh, no big change uh, going over to this uh, this technique. I, I would okay. say. Great, thank you very much indeed. Another question that's come through. Um, we talked specifically about low profile gastrostomy. Can you also place jejunal tubes using this technique? Absolutely, you can put in anything. Uh, so it is uh, actually um, when you do the pull peg, you are you 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 well you can you can put in a pull peg and then you can put in an in 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 uh, Inner thinner tube which you introduce into the uh, intestine, but uh, using this um, introduce a kit and the split tube, you can put in anything, any tube actually. Great. Okay, so some good universal application for mm -hmm. it as well. And you have uh, we use, as I said, the 14 French that is with the red market, but there are different uh, widths. Uh, there are. Uh, of the of that tube, so you can have a larger if it's needed. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our questions here. There's um, one other question. We we very much looked at this from a procedural point of view. We've looked at the short, medium term um, outcomes as well. What do your um, nursing teams say to you once the procedure's been done? Have you observed any improvement in um, the feedback that you're getting from your nursing colleagues about? The outcomes using this technique. Yes, it, well, uh, the, the the positive thing that is that they, they they then can, so to speak, have it under control and take care of the stoma with the with the pull peg tube, the fricka peg. They have to to um, organize for the second session, and uh, there was often. Uh, uh, Frustration about the waiting time for, for, for that procedure to be done. It, it, sometimes the time week just went by. So 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 so, so get rid of that problem is uh, of great importance. Um, then on the other hand, uh, they have to take care. They have to. We get feedback from the nurses saying that well now you tight you, 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 you lock the the anchor circuit too tight or. The, the tube was too short, so um, it is important to have this um, team with with uh, nurses that are trained and that you know well. And you have uh, even with these nurses working at distance, we have uh, contact with them regularly, and uh, our nurse have contact by phone, and and they can come back with with questions and and. Uh, Feedback and, and we can give advice and so on. So it's actually in the in region we have a kind of, of large team as well with, with our uh, countryside hospitals with the clinicians and pediatricians uh, distance from Gothenburg. Thank you very much indeed. I think we're at a, a position now where we've um, we've answered the, the questions that have come in on the, the chat portal as well. We've answered um, some questions that have come in independently. Um, throughout the webinar also. I would just um, ask Professor Gothberg one last question. What is the, that one resounding improvement that this technique has given you and your hospital and your patients? Well, it is still that we can do it in one, one procedure. It doesn't need to come back some months later to do it in the second procedure. Thank you. And of course, they ask for the button. So, so it's, Get rid of that tube is also of the uh, good value. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, I would like to say thank you very much to Professor Gothberg. Thank you ever so much. Thank for you. Coming thank you for letting show. me come here. It's been a pleasure to have you. I'd like to also thank very much everybody that starred in and shown an interest in today's webinar. The question, the second question that we asked earlier on, um, implies that there's some interest to talk about the introducer kit. Thank you. We do have um, some uh, contact details to get in touch with you. We'll be able to um, identify who, if you would like to know a little bit more, would be interested in using the Mickey Introducer Kit. So we'll, our sales team will be in touch with you very soon 
to arrange that and to support you um, through that next stage. But thank you ever so much again um, for joining us and we look forward to, to welcoming you again next time on another um, Vigon Stroke Halyard Health webinar. So um, thank you ever so much and we wish you goodwill. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.